بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غناظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسانا إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Again, it's a great pleasure of mine to be here with you this evening at Al Minhal and to join the uh, lineup of respected and esteemed uh, Imams and Shaykh talking about a very important topic, of course, on the minds of many parents and community leaders the development of our youth, a very precious resource of ours. Uh, the leaders of tomorrow and we're talking about as the title suggests planting today to harvest tomorrow so the idea of course is to put our best effort in early to sow good seeds in fertile soil and then to manage that in the best way possible in hopes that in the future, the harvest which we reap will be very delightful and tasty, if you will. That does require a great deal of patience for a person to not receive immediate gratis grat 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 gratification and satisfaction from the efforts that they're putting in it demands from those that are investing fortitude, forbearance, patience, insight, and the ability to see the potential in the future. So in this session, we're going to be discussing Bidni Ta'ala, very, very integral part of our children's development and continuing education into their adulthood and that is the development of manners. Now there is a saying that has been attributed to one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, which is something similar to play with them for seven, refine them teaching them manners for seven, educate them for seven, be companions to them for seven, and then let them go on their way. Something like this that has been attributed to, from my research, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. I've yet to be able to authenticate that myself or to find someone that has authenticated it. The reality is that the manners of the Muslim are often the first thing that they begin to learn. And this is even from the scholars of Islam, some of them having been quoted to have said that we began to learn manners before we began to learn knowledge. That we were taught manners and behavior, character and etiquette before we began to seek the knowledge of Islam. So to begin with, merit, uh, begin, begin with manners of, is of course considered to be a starting point in the development of a child. The interesting thing about manners is that they are acquired just like knowledge is acquired. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al-ilmu bit-ta'allum Knowledge is acquired by learning. Wal-hilmu bit-ta'allum and forbearance is acquired through imposing it upon the self, if you will. Meaning you have, to, you have to go out and you have to do what's necessary to get it. So manners or the character or the, uh, the, 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 the way a person carries themselves, it's not enough for someone to say, 
This is just who I am. This is just me. Meaning, if I'm an angry person, then that's just me. If I'm quick to judge, that's just me. If I'm impatient, that's just who I am. I'm hot-headed. I'm ill-tempered. That's just me. The reality is, is that's who you have become. But it's not who you have to be. Manners, they are something which you have to adorn yourself with. As you put on your clothes, manners you also have to put on. They have to be learned, they have to be acquired. And then they have to be imposed. The person has to continue to maintain. So often we find we're talking about akhlaq or khuluq. It's interesting, the Arab, they always have very uh, nice names for things that are meaningful. So khuluq, it is said that it, it is derived from the word khalq, which is creation. The person's khalq is that they're tall or that they're short or that they're broad or that they're dark hair or light hair. Their khalq is that they're blue eyes or brown eyes. But their khuluq is their, their manner and their etiquette. It is their character. So they say that the reason that a person or that the word manners and behaviors was called khuluq is because a person is supposed to adopt them and practice them and adorn themselves with them so much with such consistency that a person would say that is min khilqatihi, min khalqihi, from his creation, from his natural existence. That's the way he was made. Meaning, patience is observed all of the time. Honesty is observed all of the time. Uprightness is observed all of the time. Forbearance is observed all of the time to the best of our abilities. Not something where you have good manners in the masjid and you have bad manners outside. You have good manners in the home with your parents and then you have bad manners at school. So, when we look at the manners of Islam, we find there are a number of different types. If you're following along here, there's a, there's a handout. This is the, the outline which you can jot some notes down on if you so desire. And on the back of it, you'll find there's some uh, additional reading uh, resources for you. Just as a benefit to keep track of. So there's a number of different types of manners that we're looking at from our kids. In manners that are initiative. A person has to initiate them. They have to start them on their own accord. And then there are manners that are responsive. A person responds to situations. The manners which a person is required to initiate, for example, would be saying Assalamu Alaikum to initiate Islamic greeting. To intend to do something without having to respond or being prodded or pushed. And there are many manners in Islam that are or that should originate from a person on their own accord. And then there are the manners that are responsive. A person responds to situations. When someone says Assalamu Alaikum. The proper manner and etiquette is to say, Wa alaykum salam. And not hi or bye or what's up. If someone sneezes, then the initiative is to say, Alhamdulillah. And then the response is to say, Ya Allah. And then there's another response after that, Ya Hadikum Allah. Wa yuslihu balakum. Just for an example. An initiative would be to pray extra. That which is not obligatory. This is an initiative. To pray an extra prayer. Stand up in the night. Something you're not obliged to do. Something that's requested. But it's not you having to respond to a call of obligation. And there are manners of different levels. Varying levels are manners with Allah. That's right. We have akhlaq. There's khuluq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are manners with his speech, the Qur'an. There are manners with his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then there are manners with the self. We have manners with our own selves. We have things to deal with. The heart, for example. Is it left to be sullied and soiled? Or are we in the mode 
of purifying and taking care of the types of manners that we have with ourselves. And then there's manners with the rest of creation, society, and they begin in terms of their nature and obligation closer to you and then further out. Your parents. To your parents you are to be benevolent and respectful, kind and loving. And then everyone after that, your close relatives, those in your household, your extended relatives, your neighbors, your community members, and your society at large. There are all certain manners and etiquettes that are to be observed when interacting with them. Islam, it places a great deal of importance on manners. The Prophet وسلم, of course, himself, he says, That I was sent to complete or to perfect noble manners. Another hadith, same thing, salih al-akhlaq, the righteous manners. The Prophet وسلم, was sent to perfect the manners on all levels, all types, for all situations, so that the ummah would be a well-mannered, well-cultured and refined ummah. The Prophet وسلم, was described as such in the Quran by Allah Azawajal. That you display magnificent manners, if you will, as a translation. The Prophet وسلم, himself was refined by Allah. Though the Prophet وسلم, from the very beginning of his life, Allah was protecting, preserving, developing. But with the coming of the message, that was even more so. So the Prophet وسلم, he would spend a great deal of his effort, if not all of it, we could consider it to be teaching, etiquette, manner, and character. And the reward for that is so great, as was highlighted by the Prophet وسلم, in many hadith. There are many, many hadith that talk about the importance of, of manners and the, the reward of them. The Prophet وسلم, was asked, Su'ila Rasulullah وسلم, he says, on, uh, on ma nas al -jannah. That which enters people into the paradise the most. So the Prophet وسلم, he said two things. Taqwallah wa husnul khuluq. To have taqwa, to keep your duty to Allah, to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to have good manners, to have good etiquette and behavior. The Prophet sallallahu another hadith, and this could go on for a very a long conversation to narrate all of the hadith, but one of them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he began saying, Ana za'imun, I've been entrusted, be baitin, with a house, he began, bi al jannah, he says, in the lowest level of paradise, he says, for the one that abandons argumentation, even if they're right. Even if they're correct. The next one he says, I have been entrusted with a house in the middle level of paradise for the one that leaves off lying even if they are joking. And the last one he says, been entrusted with a house in the highest levels of Al Jannah for the one who beautifies. Hassana Khuluqa. That means they actually eff they put effort into it. They, they struggled with it and they adorned themselves with that good Husnul Khuluq. So this is just a few examples of the great importance and the great reward. Listen, manners, they are your defining quality. They are a defining quality of us as human beings. People will judge us based upon our manners, if they're a good person or if they're a bad person. Polite, well-mannered, easygoing, or they are rude, rough, cold. If you're fair, honest, or if you're a cheat and a liar. Our manners will also 
be our defining qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa is also going to define us by our manners. And there's a hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, he says that he says, Inna sidq yahdi ila al -bir. He says that honesty it leads to piety. Wal birru yahdi ila al -jannah. And that piety it leads to paradise. He says, Inna rajula la yasduqu hatta yuktabu inda Allah siddiq. That a person will speak the truth so much or until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be rewarded with, it will be written with Allah azza wa jalla that he is a truthful person, siddiq. Then the opposite size, he says, wa inna al kadiba yahdi ila al fujur. He says that lying it leads to rebellion or rebellious sin. Fujur, sinfulness, disobedience. He says, well, and then he says that the sinful al fujur yahdi ila al nar. And that this disobedience it leads to the hellfire. And he says, Inna rajula la yakdibu hatta yuktabu inda Allah kathaba. That a person will lie and continue to do so until they are recorded and written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a liar. So these are from the manners of the, of the Muslim. They are truthful or they are liars. And it defines us as who we are in this life and certainly in the next. So as parents, as parents, we have to have a great deal of concern for our kids and their manners. As the Prophet wasallam had a great deal of concern for his companions and their manners. And we can see that through the lives of his Sahaba. We can see their example. One of the examples that comes to mind, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu in narrating hadith, even though he was one of the later companions in the time of the Prophet sallallahu was a very close student. There are many hadith that display his manners. There was one scenario in which he was riding into his neighborhood and he called out to his mother. Assalamu alaikum from afar. Nowadays, many times the kids are embarrassed to say Assalamu alaikum to their parents, let alone when everyone can hear from far off. Assalamu alaikum. Ya ummata. He's calling at his mother, calling directly. And he made a prayer. He says, May Allah have mercy upon you as you had mercy upon me while I was being, while you were raising me. And so his mother responded, Wa alaikum salam. And she said something to the effect, May Allah honor you as you have honored me in your, in your adulthood. Abu Huraira, one time he saw two people coming off on the horizon, two men. And as they came closer, he asked one, he says, Who are you to him and him to you? And he said, this is my father. And then he began to explain manners, the child, the son, even though they're adults, they are grown men. He says, this is your father, you should not call him by his name. You should not precede him. You should not go before him. And he explained a number of etiquettes that are to be displayed with the parents, with the father. This is something crucial to have these, these great manners. So as parents, we... We cannot expect that our children will grow up and develop those manners without direction and guidance. Certainly not the manners that we're looking for in the current condition that they're living. In the society in which we are. I'll give you a little example, one of my own personal experiences. Now, here in America, Many of you uh, are, are from other cultures, countries, and uh, as adults, it's easy to stay isolated from pop culture and, 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 and mainstream American etiquette, protocols, if you will. But, for example, the neighbors here, 
There are pockets of, 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 of communities that the neighbors, they have a lively, very, a very enriching neighborly experience. But there are many places in American culture where the neighbor is not the first person you want to share with or talk to or even see sometimes. You run inside so you don't have to say hello to the neighbor. To visit the neighbor sometimes is it's, it's, it's unheard of. You could go years and years, and some of us, we actually do this. We go years living in the same house, and we do not know who the person is next to us. We don't know. Even if they have a right upon us as, their, as our neighbor, we don't know their name, if they have kids, what they do. We don't help. We don't seek to protect. We don't, any of that type of thing. So I remember one situation I, I, after I had gone overseas, had gone to study a little bit in Al Medina, and had spent uh, some time with the locals there and learned some of the tradition and the manners and the custom. And when you go inside, and this is from the etiquette of Islam, by the way, when you go inside, they offer you something. They give you something. Something to eat or something to drink or they bring you coffee or they bring you, like in Saudi, they bring you coffee and dates and they'll bring you sweets or snacks or if it's the traditional time to eat, they'll present you with a meal. That they'll always present something. It's a sign of gratitude and uh, generosity of, uh, to, to ingratiate themselves to their guests, if you will. And so... I had been living like this. I enjoyed it. I thought, this is such a great thing. This really like brings together the neighbors. It strengthens the bond to give and to receive and, and to reciprocate as well. So one summer I came back during my summer vacation and I, I stopped by uh, extended family, extended relative, someone I had not really known, into the, to visit, just to say hello, to pop in, make a visit. So I sat down. We're in the house. I was traveling too. I was a traveler. So I wasn't just a guest, but I was also a traveling guest. So that makes it even more of a, of a situation there. So I sat down, and of course, it's like around lunchtime or whatever, and I'm sitting there. And the uh, woman of the house comes, the daughter, I should say the daughter of the house comes in, and she sits down, and she's got food with her. What does she start doing? She starts eating it. What am I doing? I'm watching. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, fried chicken too. <laughs> so then the woman of the house comes in, the mother. The daughter was, she was uh, not, not a little girl. She was, you know, mature. So then the mother comes in and she says, oh, how are you? Good, good, great. So I'm watching and I'm, I don't, I don't want to ask, but I, I, I forgot where I was for a moment. Honestly, forget where I'm at. So I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, okay, I'm hungry, but I don't want to ask. It seems kind of out of place to ask. I say, um, you want me to make you a sandwich? I said, no, thank you. No, thank you. So this is the culture that we're in. These types of Islamic manners, they are totally absent. They're totally absent. They're not present. So if your child is, is being raised by society and pop culture, they won't see anything wrong with this as those people saw nothing wrong with it. If I sit in front of you, this is my food. I bought this food. So I'm going to eat it. And I will not consider you. You can buy your own. There's a restaurant down the street. If I come, if you're in my house and I ask you, do you want something to eat? I'm not worried about you being shy. Because, in general, we're not a shy people. We're not a shy people. I was shy at the point to say, yes, I would like something to eat. Instead of just saying, here, let me give you. And then if I don't want it, I can return and say, oh, thank you, or I can eat what I can, and then I'll leave the rest, whatever it may be. So if we're looking for our children to be cultured and refined by society, then they will be a reflection of those that refine them, or the lack of the word thereof. So we have to be very active in imparting good manners and etiquettes and character to our children. The beauty of Islam, alhamdulillah, is that we don't have to decide what manners are good and bad. We don't have to come up with a set of customs and, and etiquettes and behaviors because culture, pop culture, is something that's always changed. 
What is in today is out tomorrow. What's considered good today is, is bad tomorrow and to the end of it. We can see that. But from Allah's wisdom and His mercy to the Ummah is He has given us a set of etiquettes, protocols, behaviors, and identity, if you will, that is divinely inspired. That is good for all times and all places. And it is of the highest quality and caliber. So those, those, those manners that are imparted, they are done in a number of ways. First is our preaching. We have to preach to our children. And then we have to teach our children. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. The manners. And the sources are there for us, alhamdulillah. The Quran, the Sunnah, the stories of the great companions and the pious of this ummah to find what defines and determines the manners, the protocols, the behaviors that our children should adopt. And we'll talk about some of those examples here shortly. So we begin with preaching, and this is the easiest when the child is very young. When the child is very young, you can preach at them, you can talk to them. You can say these are the do's and the don'ts, and the younger they are, the more likely they are to accept. As they grow older, they need a teacher and not a preacher. They need to know why. They need to know for whom. They need to know what's the benefit. They have to be, they have to be convinced at times. And as parents, we have to understand which role we need to play. Why? What for? As a parent, you should never shun this question from your kid. You should never look away from this or, or put them down because of, it, because of it. And I've had a number of parents approach me with this. They're asking me about these questions and I'm telling this, why are you asking this? You didn't ask this when you were in the womb of your mother. Like, you don't have any business asking me these questions. But we're in a culture where people want to be convinced. And our children are growing up to be open-minded and to be uh, scholarly and, invest and, and to investigate into things. And so we have to be able to explain. Which requires us as parents, when we're imparting manners and behaviors and identity, to have the tools ourselves to give. If we don't have anything to give, then they will receive nothing. And the just because I said so rule will only last so long with any given kid. Do this because I said so. Especially when it is in contradiction or conflict with what's popular in society. If we're asking them to do the other thing, <clears throat> it's going to take a lot of convincing a lot of reasoning. It's going to take them to do it with yaqeen, with certainty that they're doing the right thing if everything outside is telling them to do otherwise. So one of the strongest, most impacting manners in which the parent imparts good manners and behavior to their children is through example. To lead by example. And the Prophet وسلم, this was one of the most powerful manners in which he taught the Ummah was through example. لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْأَخْرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah you will find a great example, an uswa. Because he led by example. When the Prophet ﷺ commanded and preached for people to pray, he prayed the most. When he told them to give, he gave the most. When he commanded them to sacrifice, he sacrificed the most. When he told them to go out and dig, he was alongside digging with them. This was the Prophet ﷺ. And so you can see the investment that he put into his Sahaba, the investment of tarbiyah, of cultivating and refining, that the, the harvest, it was, it was more than anyone could have expected from the Sahaba. So let's take a minute and look at some examples, some manners that we are looking for from our kids and our role as leaders, leaders by example that is. The Muslim identity. Many of us want our children to identify themselves as being Muslim. They, we want our children to be proud that they are Muslim. We want them to be 
happy as Muslim kids and not feel ashamed or be embarrassed. We don't want them to have to feel like they have to hide or we don't want them to have to feel like they have to change. They're Muslim at home and when they go off to school or when they go out to the playground or when they go and do whatever activities they do and they're in the company of non-Muslims that they feel they have to cover themselves. We don't want that to happen. But where are we as parents in that regard? Our kids, they, at some point, they begin to see what we do as being more powerful than what we say. So we also have to have a strong identity as Muslims. If we want our children to have a strong identity, we have to have one as well. If we want our children to pray, we have to lead by example. We have to be the first to prayer. We have to be the first one to, to be on time in our prayer. I'll give you an example here, and this is something that's very common. The problem is we can send mixed messages to our children. We can send very mixed messages, and we can set them up on a pathway to doing the opposite of what we're looking for. So when you are getting ready for work, and you have to be there at 9 o'clock. You set your alarm. You wake up early. Your clothes are ready. Hopefully breakfast was cooked or it's picked up on the way and you get to work at 9. All of the necessary steps were there to make it to work on time. If your kid's at school, they have to be there at 8 o'clock. You get them up early. You get them dressed make their lunch, give them lunch money, make sure they have their books. You drive them to school to get there at 8 o'clock on time. This is great behavior. But when you come to Juma and you are late, the Juma starts at 1 o'clock and it ends at 1.30, and you're walking in at 115, 120, 125, 129. Not one time, but consistently walking in late to the Juma prayer. It's poor etiquette to come late. But you're sending a message to the child that the school and the work, they mean more than the Juma prayer. To be on time means more for school and for Juma or for, for school and work, then to come to Jumma prayer. You can be late for that because it's not that valuable. That's the message that's being sent if you haven't figured that out or acknowledged it. That's the message that kids get. And they'll grow up like that. They'll grow up in that manner. They'll begin to equate the dunya as being more valuable and important than the deen. Behavior in the masjid, for example, is another manner or an etiquette that a lot of people complain about. It's Ramadan. The noise is just too much. The kids are running, loud, playing games at the inappropriate time. The masjid can be used as a multi-purpose center, of course, as it was during the time of the Prophet wasallam. But its, its primary function is for Allah's worship and remembrance. So when those things, uh, they are uh, scheduled incorrectly, there's a conflict. And everything should be given way to worship and learning. So when we come to the masjid and we bring our kids, and we ourselves, while the imam is talking, the sheikh is giving a lecture. We're in the corner and we're having side conversation, playing on the phone, doing whatever. Our kids see that. When we're at home, and the news is on, the game is on, the show is on. What do we do with the kids? What do we do? Shh, I'm watching the news. Do not interrupt me. Out of the room. I'm watching my game, the game is on. Do not interrupt my game. We will reprimand those kids right away. We will send them to their room, we will call their mother, we will have them removed from the, from the house if necessary because the news is on, the game is on, I'm reading the paper. 
What do you think that they're learning? What are they learning from that? What? The news is more important. The game is more important. The show is more important. I have to be quiet. I have to listen. I have to concentrate. I have to focus. I have to be respectful. But when I'm sitting in the masjid and the imam is giving the khatira or the, the khutbah or he's giving the lecture or the lesson, the shaykh is there. It's not that valuable. So I can tune it out and I can chit chat and talk. I can be distracted. I don't have to pay attention. So this is behavior that is ingrained in the child from a very young age. Not because we told them to do that. We didn't tell them, if the imam is talking, then you talk. We tell them, when the imam's talking, don't talk. But if they see us doing it as well, on a consistent basis, they begin to see that, that that's just theoretical, but practically we can do. So these are the types of very, very important roles that we have to play as parents, respecting our elders and our parents. A lot of times as parents, we demand our children to respect us. We command their respect. And then we complain when they do not. Say, my kids are doing this at home and they're not, they're not listening, they're not obeying, they're not prompt when I call their name. We have to ask ourselves as well as parents, how do we treat our own parents? How are we treating our parents? Because our children, they see that. They see if you're flustered. They see if you're frustrated. They see if you have abandoned. You don't communicate. You don't talk. If your life, for example, is that your parents are someone else, somewhere else. They're not with you in the house or with you in the neighborhood or you don't visit them regularly. But they see you have abandoned and left. You don't talk. You don't call. You don't take the time. They will see that as kids. So when they grow up, they will learn that the parents are somewhere else. They're off and you don't have to communicate. You don't have to talk. You don't have to keep up with. They'll figure all of that out through your action. Regardless of how much you preach and you scream at them, the result will be the same. Another one of the great manners of the believer is to be merciful and forgiving is to be merciful and forgiving it says man la yarham la yurham As the prophet sallallahu says whoever does not show mercy will not have mercy shown to them irham man fil ard yarhamuka man fis sama that if you show mercy to the ones on the in the earth you show mercy to those in the earth then the one who was above the heavens will show you mercy. This, of course, is a very, very beautiful manner, an etiquette, behavior, character to have. And the Muslims should be the most merciful people and kind to Allah's creation. But if our children are seeing us being unforgiving and relentless with others, we won't let things go. We won't come down. We won't step down. But we are relentless and we are ugly. How do we expect that they will learn mercy and forgiveness? When someone wrongs you, if you can't forgive them, you can't show mercy to them, your child that is watching you, that is imitating you, that is looking up to you, he's going to learn that if someone wrongs you, then you get revenge if he sees that's what you do. Someone cuts you off. Right? And on traffic, this is a very typical one. Because we all deal with traffic. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you start cursing and yelling and sign language of all sorts. Your child sees that in the car. How do you think they're going to learn to respond to such a situation? If you're at the stoplight and you just will not let that person come in, right? They got their blinker on. They're like, please, I, I just want to get in. I got to go, you know. And you're like... You inch up, inch up, and you don't show any mercy or forgiveness. Just say, okay, bismillah, here you go. You don't give way to them. Do you think that your child's going to grow up and be the one that gives way to you or to whoever else? Bismillah, go. Go in front of me. Go ahead. No, they're going to see that this is how the behavior is. Kind to neighbors, we go back to that issue. 
Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let them honor the neighbor. Let them honor the neighbor. The Prophet ﷺ used to order the companions that if they were cooking in the morning time, maraq, which is like soup, you know. Cook the meat in the water, you get the water, you, it's like broth. It says add extra water to it so that you can give some to the neighbor. SubhanAllah. So if you are in your house and the neighbor comes knocking and you're not answering the door, shh, we're not here. How is the child going to learn ikram al-jar, haq al-jar? If you're not checking on your neighbor, if they don't see you, for example, you know the neighbor is sick or out of town, you go and collect the mail, for example, you put the trash can out for them, you notice that they're late, you take the trash can up, you, you check on them from time to time. If there's snow on the driveway, you offer to help shovel up the driveway. Even you just do it on your own accord. How will our children learn to take good care of the neighbors and to treat them kindly? If you don't put any investment in your neighbor and show that, then they won't think it's worth it to do it themselves. If your children see you lying, cheating, swindling, then how will they learn to be honest? Be of those who are truthful. But if you're taking shortcuts and lying, someone calls the, someone calls the phone, you say to the kid, tell them I'm not here. Right? Little, these are little things, little things, and little things go a long way. The phone rings, they pick it up, tell them I'm not here. He says, oh, boy, he's not here. You're teaching your kid to lie. You're teaching the child that lying is good, it's okay. The Prophet Sallallahu he said what? أَنَا زَعِيمٌ بِبَيْتٍ فِي وَسْطِ الْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْكَذِبِ he says, I'm promised, I'm entrusted with a house in the middle level of paradise for the one who, who abandons lying, even if they're joking. So if we're not honest as parents, our children will note that. Even we'll be, uh, we'll be dishonest to our own kids at times. We will lie straight to our kid's face. And they will learn that quality. If you can lie to your kid about something, then know that you're teaching them to lie to you. A lot of times we'll do that. Yeah, I'm going to take you here later on. We're going to go out. I promise, I promise, I promise I'm going to take you to get ice cream. I promise you were good, you did great, you prayed, you were at the masjid, you were quiet. I promise you I'll take you to ice cream. No, just wait, just wait. Next, at 5 o'clock, I'm going to take you 5 o'clock. No, 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 wait. 6 o'clock, I'm going to take you 6 o'clock. I promise. The, the boy or the girl's going, Daddy's promised, Daddy promised. Yes. Oh, I can't, I can't, sorry, I can't do it. You broke your word. So what do you think the kid's going to take from that? It's okay to break your word. It's okay. Especially if that's done on a consistent basis. Especially if it's done on a consistent basis. The kids are going to learn that the word means nothing. My word means nothing. And the Muslim, they live and they die by their word. They live and they die by their word. Or at least they should. It's the etiquette of the, the Muslim. When they say something, they, 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 they come through, they follow through. Yeah, Juan. You say something, you follow through. You said three o'clock, Bismillah. What time? What? Four? Three. Come on, man. Four. Come on, man. Three? I said three. That's not three. That means 3.30ish. Don't be hard. No, you said three, it's three. If you're real good, it's 250. Just in case. Right? That's, 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 that's honesty, that's truthfulness, that's uprightness, that's manners. That gives value to the Muslim. That gives value to the Muslim. People, and people are affected by that. People are affected by that. Look, a lot of times people are affected more by what you do than they are by what you say. They are affected oftentimes by more than what you by, by what you do more than what you say and I can testify to that myself this is before I accepted Islam I met a number of Muslims out of intrigue and interest and I was affected by their manners more than I was by what they said they were young 
college students, they didn't have a lot to offer in terms of knowledge. They didn't have a great deal to offer in terms of explaining the deen. Most of the learning that I went through, the process of learning Islam, it was done through reading. But the effect that they had on me was through their manners. The manners that they had. A Muslim is one who is pure from foul words and ugly speech. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yaqul khayran aw la yasmut. That if you believe in Allah on the last day, then you should say good words or you should be quiet. We have this in American uh, sayings, if you don't have anything good to say, then don't say anything at all. So if you are telling your child, do not curse, do not this, do not that, but then you're doing it, What example are we setting for the kids? Islam becomes theoretical. It's only theoretical, not practical anymore. We remove the practical level of the practical, reachable Islam that is practiced, and we just leave it for theory, the bookshelf, the bookcase, the imams, the, the religious people that come and hang out in the masjid all the time. That's for the, that, that's the, the real life people, however, that's just all theory. That's what we're teaching if we are not leading by example. So, brothers and sisters, when we are trying to preach good manners and teach good manners, either through the word or through example, there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. We'll close with this. As a parent, as, as part of parenting, you have to reward your children for good behavior, to encourage them. You have to show appreciation for good behavior. You have to set goals for their behavior and their manners and then reward them for that. You can give gifts as encouragement. And when they do good, you include them in more of your activities as they grow older and are able to manage themselves with the manners that you have imparted. Then you can begin to include them in more of your activities as part of their development. And this is particular to the brothers, to the men, the fathers. Yeah, he, some cultures, they, I understand, everyone has their own culture and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bash anybody or make anybody feel out of place. But I remember one time somebody said, I had, I had my kids with me, uh, my son in particular, I could take him around. When he got to the age of being able to sit and, and, and be quiet, I, I'd take him around with me. I'll take him wherever I go. I didn't bring him today because he has some house guests that are visiting. I like to take him to see how things go, how a man acts. He can watch his father, can watch other adults, how they talk and converse. He can learn protocols, that type of thing. Somebody said to me, oh, babysitting today, huh? I said, babysitting? No, I'm not a babysitter. I'm a father. This is my kid. If it was your kid, I'll be babysitting. If it was your kid or this neighbor's kid, I'll be babysitting and you'll be paying me for it. Unless I'm that generous, I'm just like, okay, I'd love to watch your little, little angels <laughs> for half the day or more. I said, no, I'm, I'm a, this is my son. I'm a father. I'm watching out for my, I'm, I'm, we're, we're in this tarbiyah right here. This is how you bring up a kid, you know? So us fathers, the opportunity, when it arises, you, you should bring. Bring along, encourage, participation, and attendance. Let's go. I'm, going, I'm traveling. I have a business trip. You're coming with. It doesn't always have to be about the video games and the fun and the, and the sports and all that. You're coming with. You're going to see how a man does. I'm going to the masjid for a lecture. You're coming with. And you're not going to play basketball this time. If you do good, you can play basketball afterwards. If you do good. You sit quietly. You remember. I'll ask you some questions. If you do good, you go play basketball with your friends for an hour. Age appropriate, of course. Reward and include. The next thing is responding to poor manners, right? We have to encourage good manners and then we have to respond to the poor manners. We don't react, but we respond. The first thing as a parent when responding to poor manners is considering the child's age. You have to consider their age. 
The younger they are, the more you should expect that there will be slip-ups and mistakes. And you need to deal with it appropriately. You cannot be overboard here. You could break a child very easily. You will turn them away from you. You will push them away from you if you are overly hard and stern. Then you have to weigh the infraction, what they did, what was wrong. Is it something tremendously terrible or is it just something that you can overlook and then deal with? And reprimanding is done appropriately. And this was something that we touched on in the previous session together, but I'll recap this. That when your child does breach the protocol or does not observe the proper manner or etiquette or behavior, one of the things that is crucial for you as a father and your child is that you do not embarrass them. Because that's showing them a bad manner to embarrass people, to expose people. Good advice is given sincerely. And the best sincere advice is given privately. I'll give you a good example of this. This is when I was an adult. As I had just moved into the uh, new apartment in school in Medina, I moved into a, uh, what I consider to be the culturally historic part of town. You know what I mean? It was historic. Meaning all of the buildings were very old and they'd been there for a while. And it was a, a kind of a Bedouin neighborhood. Very basic stuff. Local guys. And my landlord, we developed a relationship immediately, uh, him and I. Uh, he was a family man, older guy. He had 40 kids. Yeah, 40, I said. And by the time I left, he had 42 or 3. So, mashallah, is a, is a factory going on, <laughs> which I'm sure has not ceased in its production. And then, listen to this. I don't I want to jump off the topic, but I think this is quite entertaining. We take a little break here. So, part of my experience with these guys, these Bedouin guys in, in, in Medina, this particular family, we're sitting there, him and I. He used to invite me before I got married all the time for dinner. Because, you know, it's a single guy, miskeen, don't know how to cook much, eggs, okay, cheese, bread, that kind of stuff. So, he's inviting me for dinner. But his cuisine wasn't much better than that. Soup every night. Shurba every night, same thing, same thing. Every once in a while, there'd be a piece of meat in there. He said, oh, going fishing, huh? He grabbed the meat. So we're sitting there talking, chit-chatting. This little girl walks in, like six, seven years old, probably. And she says, she says, Ya Sa'ad, wain al gahwa She says, Sa'ad, his first name. Where's the coffee? So me, after learning a bit about the etiquette, you know, I'm like, whoa. What just happened? This little girl walks in, calls him dude by his first name, Saad. So right away after he said it's in the back room, whatever, and she gets in and walks out, he turns around and I said, I gave him this look and he goes, ah, you're wondering who that is that they will call me by my first name. I was like, yeah. I said, isn't that your daughter? He says, no. That's my little sister. <laughs> I said, what? Your little sister, and I met his father. His father, mashallah, was Sheikh. Sheikh Al-Qariya. Old guy. He's walking with the stick, you know, like this. He's hunched over. He said, yeah. I got a couple siblings like that. My father recently got married again to a younger girl. She's in her 30s or so. And they've had some kids. I said, subhanAllah. Inni mukathirun bikum al-umam. The Prophet I will be, I will boast to be the most populated of the of the nations. So this guy, one night, we were at a at a at a, at a uh, invitation in the neighborhood. They invited us over uh, to eat, and you know the style of eating there is very different from what I'm accustomed to here. Everyone has their own plate here, and as a kid. My parents always said, eat over your plate. 
right? When you have your own plate, you eat over the plate. You don't sit back and eat so the food drops into your lap or all over, but the food should drop back into the plate. It's yours. So this is what is ingrained in my mind, is when you eat, you eat over the food you're eating. And so we go to this uh, gathering of men. I was the youngest there. They're all old, gray hair. And so they got the the large tray of chicken and rice or whatever is there and so I start eating and I learned how to eat with the hand and cut the meat with the hand or all that kind of thing and so I'm eating but I'm leaning over the plate the tray and I did not think anything of it nothing wrong here it's just normal everyone I feel like I'm part of the crowd I felt like I was in as a younger foreigner that had been invited with the local population I was there and I was enjoying what I could understand of their conversation so then at the end, my landlord, he says, he, he waits. He says, I get up to go. He says, wait, wait. He tells me to wait, so I don't know what's going on. All of them get up to go out to the next, the next location because it's, like it's like a hopping party. You know, we're going to this house and that house for tea and this house for whatever. So he holds me back and he says, listen, I know you don't know this, so I wanted to tell you privately so that I wouldn't embarrass you. But when you are eating, you're leaning over the tray, and everyone is looking at me. I said, what's the problem? I said, everyone's looking at me like, like, given the signal, you know, like, what's this stranger? What is he doing? I said, well, tell me, Sheikh, what, what's going on? Did I, did I, is it like a taboo or something? Did I do something? He says, listen, in our culture, you see this big tray here and this big plastic surrounding it? He says, when you eat, the plastic is for your food that drops from your hand or your mouth not back into the tray of food that everyone's eating from. He said, everyone that was looking at me, they were looking at me with this like, like, should we stop eating and throw up kind of look or what? A major error, right, in terms of protocol and etiquette at the dinner table. But, alhamdulillah, not a single one of them embarrassed me by pointing it out right there in front of everybody. And then, my landlord an elderly gentleman, I don't want to say old, but he's, he's, of course, he was in his 50s or so. He had the wisdom and insight, the gentleness and the mercy to wait to everyone to leave and then to give me the advice. A favor we would appreciate from anyone giving us advice. And our kids, even though they're young, they still have feelings. They still have feelings and they're still embarrassed. And the more that you can do to save embarrassment for them, the the longer lasting the lesson will be. The longer lasting that the lesson will be for them. To pull them to the side, to correct the behavior, to do it in a manner which is, is appropriate, and you begin in the most gentle of ways. To be gentle, the rifq, gentleness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gentle, He loves gentleness. And He has placed some barakah in gentleness which he has not placed in harshness and severity. So oftentimes the message is received better when it is done in a gentle way. If that doesn't work, and sometimes kids cannot be penetrated by being kind and gentle. Sometimes they are in the middle of something and their engine is going and they are cruising along at maximum altitude and speed and the, the kind, hey son, whoa, wait a minute, the look, calm down, it will not work then that's when you begin to turn the, the temperature up. But it's to be turned up slowly. Slowly you turn the heat up. Right? I heard one parable. They said that we are like two hands, one washing the other from the dirt and the grime. Right? So when you, when you go to wash the hands, the grime and the dirt that's on there, you don't start rubbing in. You don't bring out the, the, the metal pad. and First you start... See if it'll come off. Just put a little water and a little rub. You, you start off slow and easy. And then as it's stuck and it won't come, then you begin to apply pressure. Get some solvent, some solution. And then eventually, with the pressure, it's, it's gone. The same thing goes with correcting children. It should be done slowly in terms of the intensity so as not to become abusive. And if you are abusive, one of the results of that is them revolting and rebelling against you. They'll be waiting. They will be waiting. And in this country, they'll be saying, when I turn 18, I'm out of here. And I've seen it. In my position, in my line of work, I've seen the very thing. 
parents are hard, they're hard, they this, they that, da, 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 to the end of it. I can't wait. I can't wait to leave. I'm ready to leave. And so if you're not merciful and kind and gentle, and you're trying to teach them manner and etiquette and everything along that process, then even if the message is received on some level or another, if you have been abusive to them, it's very possible that you will not receive and reap the fruits of your labor in them showing you good manners. If you do not show them good manners, they may never show you good manners. Listen, brothers, fathers and mothers, there's nothing wrong with saying please to your child and thank you. If you expect them to say please and thank you, then as children you begin, please and thank you. You shouldn't feel like, oh, I'm the adult. They should say please to me. If you want them to say salamu alaikum, then you should begin by saying assalamu alaikum to teach them by example, assalamu alaikum. And then when they get accustomed to the salam and understanding where they can comprehend, it's practiced, then you can say, listen, the younger one should say salam to the older. And give them the various protocols and etiquettes. There's nothing wrong with that. Please and thank you and showing good manners to the kids, even at a young age, out of kindness and as an example. Right? We're talking about planting today. We're talking about investing now, hoping to reap the rewards later. And this is some of the steps, some of the means in which we can find a good harvest in our future. I'll conclude with that with the presentation. As I said, on the back of the handout here that you have, there are some books that I have uh, recommended for further reading. I tried to keep the list short and concise. The books are also short themselves. Uh, so if you have an interest, uh, which I hope that you do, and need some resources to further understand the nature of, of manners and how to impart and the basics of them, then you could perhaps uh, add these books to your library if they are not already there. Jazakumullahu khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.